It's the rock and roll and rock and show. Yeah, we go. Bo Hill, how hey, Joe, are you? How you doing, man? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I think I had a uh, bad chord. You probably know a lot about bad chords, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more than I should. <laughs> you got to wiggle them around. Now I just can't touch it. Okay. So, so you, you, how are you doing? I, I appreciate you joining me this evening. Uh, I'm doing well. Certainly cannot com- complain about anything, that's for sure. Yeah. You're out in Texas, right? Yep. Okay. How long have you been out there? I moved back in... Uh, 2007. Okay, so you moved back. Um, you lived there before then. I, I'm an old Texas boy. Were you born in Texas? Uh, no, actually. I was born in Oklahoma, but I was raised in Texas. My, I think my mom just uh, was in the wrong place at the wrong time <laughs> when it was time for me to be born because my family is all from Texas and they've they all live here. So how old were you when you first left Texas? 17. Okay, so you pretty much grew up your younger life in Texas. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about, about your, younger, your younger self. So when, okay. when did you first get into find music, I say? That one's pretty easy. Okay. I was just kind of a, a normal, goofy kid. And I wanted to play baseball with my friends and ride my bike and things like that. My parents had a different idea. They said, okay, we're going to, we want you to go to the Texas Conservatory of Music. And this would have been when I was, I want to say second grade or third grade, something like that. And so I went to a music school and, uh, and I studied piano. And I hated it, but you know, I, I stuck with it. And then my mom started bringing home when I would have been fifth grade, maybe fourth or fifth grade. She started bringing home, uh, Elvis records and the Everly brothers and, and playing them all the time. And I was like, wow, that's really great. And then, you know, the, the crusher for me was, um, when she brought home meet the Beatles. That gotcha. And then I decided, okay, not, not only did I want to play guitar, but at age 11, and I remember this very distinctly, I went to my mom and I said, I know what I want to be when I grow up. And she said, oh, what was that? Expecting me, you know, I wanted to be an astronaut or a firefighter. Or right, like, like any normal kid. And I said, right. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know what you call it, but I want to be the guy that makes records. You wanted to... And of course, she didn't know, she didn't know what to call it either. So you so told her went, you wanted uh-huh, to, yeah. you told her you wanted to make records, not play guitar or something like that. Well, yeah, but I don't wow. I don't think that I was really uh, consciously differentiating between the making of the record versus the playing on the record. I see, I see. Okay, okay. It was just the whole the whole recording idea, make a record, and and that was that's that's what got me. I don't think that I was sophisticated enough at that time <laughs> to differentiate at all because if you were that'd be pretty amazing Mm. (laughs) agreed but the the, but the thing that i that i did grow up with and i and i was really happy about this was you know as going through junior high and high school you know all my friends or a lot of them were just kind of lost souls you know they kind of you know i I don't know my mom wants me to be a lawyer Uh, i don't know i think i'm going to be a scientist or whatever right but I felt very blessed that I had a really clear vision of what it was I wanted to do with myself, even though, you know, the actual job title didn't really exist at that point. But I, I, I really knew. Yeah. So did you have a and, plan in your head? I'm sorry? Did you have a plan in your head of how you were going to make that happen? Or were you just kind of going with it? <clears throat> well... The the first since we were talking about a really an obscure kind of kind of job which was producing records, you know, I thought, well, you know, I'm I'm a musician. I mean, I play, and so maybe that's that would be my way to do it. And so, you know, I had I was in bands and and I had two record deals I got signed to, and 
you know, if nothing else, as I, as I was maturing and as I was, you know, learning more about this business that wasn't really a business yet, I kept thinking, okay, uh, let's, let's stay with this. Right. And it wasn't until I was in, uh, I was going to school uh, in Colorado. I got a job at, at a, uh, at a very, very small jingle studio. I mean, they just, they made, you know, commercials and they did high school bands and they did polka bands and they did silly stuff like that. And so I thought, okay, this is going to be really great, you know, because I'd been in the studio already with Keith Olsen when I was 16. Mm. And, and I thought, okay, this, this will be a good opportunity. And so they hired me as a janitor. Oh yeah. And so, yeah. And I was cleaning the toilets and uh, making people coffee and, you know, but I was there. I was, I was right. in the studio. You were around it. And right. And so I was hanging out and, and everybody, you know, all the engineers and guys like that, you know, I didn't, uh, they included me, you know, they said, yeah, come on in. And uh, so, you know, when a session was over, I'd be the first one out there tearing down the microphones and wrapping the cables and uh, clearing the patch bay and stuff like that. And, and I was, you know, would ask a lot of questions and, you know, and everybody was, was pretty, um, was pretty happy to answer me. Um, So when you, you go to the patch bay, you put this plug in this spot and you put it in that spot. Why do you do that? And they would add, they'd answer me. And so over time, I worked my way up to into the engineering staff, and then I worked my way up to head engineer. Wow. And at that point, I went to the studio owner, and, and I said, listen, this place runs nine to five. It just ran like a normal business, so it, it wasn't anything particularly cool or – or uh, wasn't any late edge, but it just, nights or anything. Sorry? Wasn't any late nights or anything. No, no, no. And uh, and so I said, listen, I got an idea. Um, I think that if you let me and some of the other guys that were working there, if you let us work on our own stuff after hours, it's going to make us much faster, much more efficient. We're going to be able to experiment on our own, <laughs> and we're going to come up with a better product for the studio. And for some weird reason, he, he said, wow, that sounds like a good idea. Okay. So we worked our normal gig, you know, record a polka band or record a church choir or whatever from nine to five and then, or nine to six, whenever it was. And then at night I brought my band in and then you know, and we would, and we would experiment. We would record, and we would, you know, I made some of the worst sounding recordings <laughs> on the planet Earth. But you know, it was it was pure experimentation. So I would read, you know, recording magazines and stuff like that, and they'd say, "Well, Roy Thomas Baker records everything at plus nine. and I went, "Okay, let's try that plus nine. And, and so, you know, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, Uh but it was, it was a, it was a great way to kind of figure it out because, you know, there weren't recording schools back then. Right. It was, it was really like an apprenticeship. You know, you sit in there with somebody that's been doing it and, and I come to find out that even the people that said that they were doing it really hadn't been doing it very long themselves. So, so is um, it, is that kind of thing? Does that still happen these days? Like, do people just go and intern, so to say, at a studio and learn that way? Um, that's a very good question, uh, I, and I wish I could give you a definitive answer. I can't because I'm just not sure. Right. the The recording studio business obviously is completely different. Sure from when I was there, you know, thanks to pro tools and the digital domain. I mean, uh, people can make very sophisticated 
sounding records in grandma's basement in their underwear. Right. And but back back in those days when in the analog universe it was completely different. So I can't really speak authoritatively about how it is now. Sure. So so other you, than it's other than it's very very different. Right. So you're learning your way. What did you find was the hardest thing for you to pick up on? The hardest thing for me was probably more psychological than it was anything else. Okay. Was um, giving myself permission to follow my own gut, even though it wasn't what I'd been taught, if that makes any sense yeah, at all. Yeah, okay, okay. All right. And 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 that was that was hard for me because it was, you know... Back in those days, it was, this is the way to do it. It's not like, well, you can do it this way or this way or this way. No. Right. Here is the way you do it. Okay. Uh, and, I, and I can give you a case in point. And, and, and this took me a long time to figure out. So back in, in, in those days, and the way that I was taught was um, everything has to be big. Huge. Well, you're in Texas. So, you know, the, right. And the drums get panned hard left, hard right in order to make it big. And everything was panned hard left, hard right, blah, blah, blah. And it took me a long time to figure out that, okay, it, that's not really what it is. When you go to see, a, to see a band, like when you go to see, you know, ACDC, they don't have the drums hard left, hard right. No, the drums are, are kind of more in the middle, right? Yeah, right and they have right. a guitar player on the left and the guitar player on the right. And I, it, and, and I started thinking, well, okay, so maybe if you tighten the panoramic field a little bit, that may give you more room on the edges. Because when I grew up, everything was like in the center, hard left, hard right. Right. And I was always kind of I was always kind of mystified. I'm going like, man, this just it sounds the volume war, you know, where everything is competing against everything else because you've got everything in these basic three locations, um, panoramically speaking. And so everything was fighting and, and, and it made mixing really, really difficult. And then when I finally was able to to go, okay, hold on a second. It, maybe the drums don't need to be panned hard right, hard left. Maybe they can be panned kind of, you know, six o'clock, or I mean, uh, nine o'clock, three o'clock. Mm -hmm. And then that'll give more room for the guitars on the sides. And then once, once I kind of embraced that concept of at least being, being um, flexible, with respect to how I'd been taught, all of a sudden, everything kind of opened up. And I was like, oh, okay, I, I don't have the volume wars. Things just sit in the mix a little easier. And so that was part of all that process that I did at the Jingle Studio was spending hours and hours and hours, you know, analyzing records like I'd take my favorite records into the studio and listen to them on the studio speakers through mm -hmm. the console blah 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 so that I I could kind of see if I could hear what are they doing what's the difference right right so so I remember like the early Van Halen albums their guitar and bass and they're panned hard left and hard right right I think you're right because yeah. I remember as a kid I could turn 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 it all the way left and I'd hear bass or if I could turn it all the way right yep. and I'd hear just Eddie. Okay. Right. That's interesting how, how that can, uh, like you're saying, you know, with the drums and everything, how it creates its space. That's very interesting. Right. Well, you know, in the case of a, of a power trio like Van Halen, you know, I could, I could really see that working hard left, hard right. Mm -hmm. But when you get like, multiple guitar player like two guitar players maybe a keyboard and you got some background vocals and you got you know th then you're really trying to cram as my grandfather would say you're trying to cram you know 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag <laughs> right it's just not going to work <laughs> right well it's 
it it has certain <laughs> certain restrictions. It's going to be a mess. Oh, yeah. Man. So and so anyway, go ahead. So so after you started learning, I mean, what was your next move after that studio? Well, the result was, um, as I'd mentioned, uh, Keith Olson, who who was my mentor. Uh, he and I managed to work together when I was 16 and he, uh, was flown to Dallas where I was living with my, with my, I mean, I was still in high school and, uh, some people wanted to do a demo session with my band. And so they hired, they were from LA and they hired Keith and Keith was a staff engineer at sound city at the time. And so he came out. And we became very, very close friends. And he was the only guy in the in the music business that I knew. Um, and he hadn't really even become Keith Olson of you know Fleetwood Mac and Foreigner and Grateful Dead and right. Jesse's Girl and Pat Benatar. I mean, for crying out loud. Um, and over the years, you know, every now and then, you know, I would ask Keith. Hey, can I come out and hang out at Sound City with you? And he he said sure. And so I'd go and stay at his house, and for you know a long weekend or whatever, and and basically just sit in the background in a corner in Sound City and watch him work with lots of different artists. As a result of my experimentation after hours with my band, we kind of got a few songs and I went, you know, I think, I think this sounds pretty decent. You know, the, the writing was okay and the performances were getting really good. And the guys that were helping me were, they were good. And so I sent a, a demo to Keith and I said, what do you think of this? Am I wasting my time? Is this nuts? And he, he called me back and he, he said, um, his manager at the time was Irving Azoff of, you know, of Irving Azoff. So, um, and, uh, and he said, uh, I played it for Irving and Irving said, you know, bring this guy out here right now. And I, so I said, okay, Keith said, come out. Irving wants to meet you and he wants to set up some appointments for you. And I went, okay. And so I flew to LA and met Irving and and Irving was very complimentary about the stuff that he heard, and I was just blown away. I was like, "Wow, that's great! Thank you so much." And um, he said, "I've made some calls, and you've got some appointments tomorrow." And I said, "Okay." <laughs> and so Irving set up six meetings with the presidents of six different record companies. Nice. And and Keith. Uh, went with me. So Keith, Keith was really the, the entree. I mean, Irving set up the meetings and then Keith showed up. And at this point, you know, Keith was the hottest producer on planet earth at this point. So every record company president was ready to take a meeting with Keith. And, you know, when Keith said, yeah, you know, I think I found something that might be kind of interesting for you. And Oh, absolutely. Come on in. And so, and, and I was the little kid, you know, standing in the doorway and Keith goes in and, you know, none of these record company guys noticed me or, or cared about it or anything else. Yet they were interested in, in listening and talking to Keith and talking to about his new discovery. And so I'm standing there. I thought they, they must've thought I was his assistant or something like that. So all of these, these presidents, listen to the stuff and they're going, Oh my God, wow, we really like this. You know, when can we meet the band? And then he said, well, he's here. <laughs> and it was like him. <laughs> him. <laughs> him. And, and uh, because there wasn't really a band, it was just all my friends that were in Colorado at the time that were right. musicians and stuff. And they, they all wanted to, we got together and jammed and wrote songs and played and had a good time. Right. So, in and this is not a fishing story. In one day, I had six offers from 
the six major labels at the time. Wow, that's unheard of. It is. It, it's completely unheard of. And it, you know, and it wasn't me. I mean, it, you know, they liked the songs, but the I, but the the idea of Keith Olsen being involved and then Irving being involved, and, and it's just right. Uh, it it kind of fed upon itself. Well, sometimes it got bigger that, and bigger and bigger. Not some, because of me, but because of them. But sometimes that's what you need in your corner, right? Is something like that. Clearly, yeah. I mean, listen, I I didn't know my ass from first base. <laughs> about any of this stuff. Yeah. And so, no, n- nothing. And um, Keith wanted to do it, and I trusted Keith completely. Irving wanted to do it, and obviously Irving had a tremendous amount of weight behind him, and then it just happened. And I think Irving and Keith both knew that they were going to get offers from every single label, because you don't have Irving Azoff pick up the phone and call you and say, would you mind taking a meeting with Keith and listen to his new project that he's getting ready to get involved with? Of course, everybody's going to say, yeah. So again, it wasn't me. It was, it was just the circumstances. It was Keith happened to be really hot and happened to have like the most powerful manager in the, on the planet at the time. And there you have it. And I just happened to st- to be in the right place at the right time. And I sent him a, sent him some songs, and he went, "Wow, these are pretty good." So, so, so was this? That's the, how it happened. Was this the Airborne? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. This, so this became Airborne uh, on Columbia. Right. Right. So did you have to find other band members, or did you guys? Yes. From, okay. Okay. Um. The, the the guitar player, David Zychek, was he was another one of my, my bros from Texas that had moved up to Colorado. And so he and he'd been recording and writing with me and doing all this stuff. And uh, Larry Stewart uh, was also there. And then we didn't have a rhythm section. And Keith came up with uh, Mike Baird who went on to, I mean, he was the drummer for journey and I mean, Mm -hmm. and a, 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 Keith knew a lot of studio guys. Right. And so Mike Baird came in and then John Pierce, who went on to be with, uh, Oh, it just knocked out of my brain anyway. Um, and, and these guys were, they were studio guys that, that Keith knew about. And so they, they became our rhythm section. I see. And and that was Airborne. Okay. So when did you... Now, Airborne wasn't a long-lived band, correct? Correct. Uh, so the the record... This is actually kind of, kind of a weird story. Uh-huh. Um, Don Ellis was the executive vice president at Columbia, and he was our rabbi on that record. About a week before it came out, I may be slightly off in my dates, sure. a week or two weeks, Don uh, wrote us all a letter, Keith Irving, and, uh, and, and they shared it with the band, that he was leaving his position and he was going to become president of RCA in the UK. So now we have a record that's getting ready to be released in a week with no rabbi. Mm. I mean, no support whatsoever within um, Columbia. So you can you can guess where that went. Mm -hmm. You know, no one picked it up. No one did anything. So anyway, it was a tremendous failure. Okay. And then David Zychek and I went back to Colorado and I went back to working at the studio again. And I said, okay, we're going to do it all over again. And so David and I, um, and two, two different guys for the rhythm section went back and, made airborne Two. i mean we recorded 14 masters that 20 years later david and i released as airborne and the name of that album was called the dig because it was like an archaeological (laughs) dig (laughs) dig it up um sorry no i was saying you had to dig it up 
we did. <laughs> and so we worked on it, worked on it, worked on it, and and we couldn't we couldn't get it signed. Okay. And at that point, I went to, you know, I was completely, totally just bone crushingly dead. Sure. We worked so hard on it and, and I, and I could not get, I couldn't get anything going. And so at that point I moved to the Bahamas and I worked at a dive resort as a dive master for a while. And while I was down there, I got a call from Keith Olson and he said, would you, would you be up to audition for foreigner? And I was like, what? (laughs) And he he said, he said, yeah, um, they need a, uh, a guitar player, keyboard player that has the ability to sing really high. That's what they need to go on the road. And I went, uh, okay. (laughs) So I went and I met with, um, God, I don't remember what their manager's name was, but, um, anyway, I went and, uh, and I never actually, uh, got the audition. I mean, I went to New York and with the amount of time that it took me to get from the Bahamas up to New York, they went ahead and hired somebody else. Mm. And so there I was stuck in New York and I was going, Oh man, this is not, this is not good. So I'm, I'm in a city. I don't know. I have no money. I have no nothing. Funnily enough, one of the DJs in Denver that really supported the airborne record a guy named Frank Cody had just moved to New York and he went to work at ABC radio, the source. And so I called him and I said, Frank, man, I am, I'm in deep, deep, deep trouble. Can I crash on your couch? And he said, sure. So he came to my rescue and, you know, one thing led to another and I got an audition with a band that was formerly known as Spider with uh, Anton Fig and Holly Knight who is a name that you probably know. Uh, You know, she wrote every, she wrote for Tina Turner. She wrote for Hart. Tremendous, tremendous writer. So I got in, she quit Spider after their first album. And one of, one of a friend that I met along the way said, Hey, you know, um, Spider's looking for a keyboard player, guitar player, utility man that, does all the stuff. And and I said, wow, that's really great. Would, can you give me a phone number or can I, can you, you know, make a connection? And they did. So I went and I auditioned for Holly Knight's position within the group spider spider had lost their deal after their first, first record. And, um, and that's Anton fig from David Letterman. fame. I Mm -hmm. don't know if you know him or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I got the, I got the job and spider was managed by Bill a coin okay. who had kiss right. And, um, Billy idol and, uh, a, a couple other bands. So anyway, the, I, I got the gig and because, you know, Bill was a big time manager again. Uh, we started practicing as a brand new band and we got signed to chrysalis. And that record, uh, we made that record actually with Bruce Fairbairn and Bob Rock. Okay. Those are two names that you probably know. Yeah. yeah bon Jovi and Metallica fame. You <laughs> Exactly. Um, and uh, as we were waiting for that record to come out, an old friend of mine that used to, that booked my high school band, which was Heaven and Earth, he, he, would book us in uh, frat parties and stuff like that. It was a guy named Gordon Perry from Dallas. So Gordon called me and, and he said, Hey, listen, I, I think I found an artist that's, that's really got some potential. Can you, um, you want to fly out and help me do this record? 
And as it turned out, Gordon was a studio owner now. He had a place called Goodnight Dallas uh, that morphed into a second studio called Goodnight LA, which was right next door to Keith Olsen's place, Sound mm-hmm. City. So um, I was sitting around in New York going, okay, well, I'm, I'm waiting on the record to come out, and they're going to set it up, and we'll see what's going to happen. And I said, sure, I'll come out, and I'll help you do this. And so he introduced me to an artist named Sandy Stewart. So we started working on that record. And, um, and then there was some, I, I forget exactly how this worked, but Jimmy Iovine was living with Stevie Nicks. Oh, I remember how this worked. Okay. So Jimmy was living with Stevie and Stevie had moved in absolutely next door to Keith Olson. Keith, you know, I was sending Keith rough mixes and song ideas and stuff that I normally didn't. And Keith shared the, or I mean, Keith shared it with, uh, with Stevie and Jimmy. And Stevie was like, Oh wow, I really like this. So the next time when Stevie was doing her solo tour, she came through Dallas and we were still recording and she came, she said, I want to come to the studio and blah, blah, blah. So she did. And, uh, you know, we had her do some background vocals and things like that. And she really just fell in love with Sandy's work. So one thing led to another and, uh, and, and Stevie had just gotten signed to modern records, which was an Atlantic offshoot. Mm -hmm. And, she called Doug Morris Atlantic's president and she said, you know, I want, I want you to sign Sandy to, to modern. And Stevie was red hot at that point. You know, her first, her first record was just going completely crazy. And so Doug said, well, okay. Then, then things got a little, a little weird. So what happened was, Doug wanted like, you know, weekly rough mixes and stuff like that as to our, our progress, because, you know, it was an unknown artist that he'd never met recording in Texas. You know, it was just kind of, it was a, it was a little more risk than I think he was comfortable with, Mm -hmm. but because Stevie insisted, you know, he relaxed the rules a little bit and went, okay, whatever. So we're, making the record and I'm doing, and I'm doing the, the mixing and most of the production. I mean, Gordon owned the studio. And so he, you know, he was the co-producer, but you know, he, he wasn't really producing in that, in that sense. He was the studio owner and he was the, uh, he was the, uh, the instigator of putting everybody together, but I was doing most of the, uh, the yeoman's work of no, 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 let's do this again. No, no, no. Try a flat, not a sharp, Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And then unbeknownst to me, Gordon started, um, on every cassette that I sent that we would send to Doug, you know, I, I put down who did what, you know, on the cassette and I would put, you know, uh, mixed by Bow Hill on, you know, June 3rd, 19, whatever in the hell it was. Right. And we figured out over time that Gordon had been changing the, uh, he'd been changing the cassette labels. And so fast forward, we're getting, we're getting ready to move the project to California because now Stevie's really involved. Um, and therefore, uh, Jimmy Iovine's really involved. Shelly Yakis, uh, because Shelly's engineering Stevie and Stevie wants the best for Sandy. And there you have it. So, and, and I'm the oddball out. And so, you know, everybody gets their plane tickets and their marching orders and stuff like that, except me. Oh no. And then, and then Sandy gets very upset and, 
and it's, you know, what, where's Bo? Why aren't you guys including him? Well, no, you know, we don't really need him. You know, you got Shelly Yakis and you got Jimmy Iovine. You got the best of the best of the best. We don't really need Bo. And so Sandy, to her unbelievable credit, calls Doug and says, listen, all the mixes that you've been approving are not done by Gordon. They're done by Bo. And Doug goes, who the fuck is Bo? Oh, my God. <laughs> no. And, and San, Sandy said, he's the guy that's doing all the production and he's doing everything, everything that you're listening to. That's him. I mean, and then, okay, so Doug says, okay, I've got to get to the bottom of this. <laughs> so they allowed me to go to L.A. with, with everybody else. And we we're set up to mix at Sound City. And Doug <laughs> walks in the door and he goes, who in the hell is this Bo guy? <laughs> and I'm standing there Did and it's me <laughs> and Stevie Nicks and Sandy and um, Fishkin who owned uh, Modern, Shelly Yaka. So, it, you know, it was all, it was all the, the A team except for me. And Sandy says, oh, it's this guy. And so Doug said, okay, here's what we're going to do. And he was really, really quite annoyed at the fact that he had to come out there to straighten this out. Right. Well, of course. And so he, he said, okay, here's where we're going to do it. Um, I'm going to give you one pass to set up your mix, and then you're going to mix this record in front of me. Mm. Were you nervous? Is that okay with you? And I said, uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> And so we did it. And he sat there with his arms folded right next to me as I mixed the record. <laughs> and then he walks out and Gordon Perry was there and everybody was there expecting me to be, you know, summarily thrown out on my ear. Right. And Doug walks out and he says, this guy's mixing this record. Wow. So what did Gordon do? G Gordon did nothing. <laughs> he, he he said nothing. He couldn't do anything. This guy's mixing the record, and and uh, and Shelley Yakis was kind enough to you know he he sat in there with me. He let me do my job, but he he would say you know I think this is a little problem here, and I think maybe you might want to rethink that. Which was I was grateful because I mean Shelley had had made I don't know how many millions of records at that point. Uh -huh. So I was, I was very grateful to get any tips or any help from him. And he was, and he was very nice. I mean, he didn't, um, he, you know, he, he treated me properly. Then let right. me just put it that way. Okay. And so we mixed the record and blah, 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 blah. I went back to New York, still waiting for the Shanghai record to get released. And three weeks after I finished Sandy, I get a call from Doug's office and it's Doug's secretary. And she says, um, do you have a moment to speak to uh, Mr. Morris? And I was like, huh, <laughs> really? Yeah. And so Doug got on the phone and he said, listen, um, there's this band out in LA and I'm thinking about signing them. If you'll produce them. And I mean, I was starving and broke in New York. And I was like, this was the last thing that I ever expected to happen. And he said, and I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'd be very interested. And he said, will you fly out to LA with me tomorrow? And I was like, uh, <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. I will. And, and so we did. And I was expecting, you, you know, oh, it's going to be the the uh, Warner Brothers private jet, or it's going to be something really cool. And the thing, the thing that was so, it, it really kind of set my relationship with Doug was rather than have me fly in first class with him, he flew in coach with me. <laughs> hey, there you go. Oh, uh, well, I mean, it was, it, it, as I look back on it now, it's really quite funny. But we went out and there was this band called Rat. And so we watched them at the Beverly Theater, 2,000 screaming kids. And so they finished their set. 
Doug turned around to me and he said, so do you want to do it? And I went, absolutely. Yes, sir. Thank you. And then we walked backstage and Marshall Burl yep. was their manager, who is Milton Burl's that. nephew. Yep, I remember that. And they they closed the deal right then. I mean, we were just standing around, and uh, no one knew who in the hell I was. Well, you Doug did, said, you okay, I'm going to sign him to Atlantic. This guy's going to produce the record. Marshall looked at me, and he said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. <laughs> so what, what, what was your honest opinion of Rat? I mean, I'm sure you would have said yes, no matter who was up there. At that point. Absolutely. I mean, it was a matter of survival. But when you looked around, I mean, whether I liked that stuff or not, when I looked around and I saw the audience going crazy. Yeah. And and then when I heard, you know, Warren playing and, you know, because he's, he's a world-class player even he's when he was kind. 19 years old. Yeah. I was just... And the fact that Doug was excited about it, and I went, okay, so this may be my ticket. And so I went, yeah, love to. Wow. So when you were oh. when you started in on that record as you were making it, I mean, were you hearing these hits as you're making an album like that? Do you hear that? <clears throat> no. Okay. No, I didn't. Um, but again, you know, I had zero experience. Yeah with, you know, marketing and trends and things of that nature. I, I mean, I really was completely out of my depth. Uh-huh. Um, Doug, I saw something in me on the Sandy Stewart record that he thought, you know, okay, it's, he'll throw down a marker for me. Um, but no, I did not, I did not know. And I'll tell you a very funny story. Just remind me of about how Round and Round got picked. Uh-huh. And I'll tell you, <laughs> it'll kill you. But, you know, the band wanted Tom Allen to do the record. He was doing Judas Priest. Okay. Which was Piercy's favorite band, as I was told. And Rat was, uh, the guys in the band, they wanted to be on Atlantic. They wanted to get a record deal. And I think to a man, they were rightfully so pissed off that, that I was the baggage that came with the deal because they didn't know me. They didn't know anything about me. They didn't know my abilities or my lack of abilities. If I was, they rightfully so, you know, this was their big shot. And then all of a sudden, you know, they get Doug Morris's experiment guy to come in and, and do the record. So that made that, that made the first record extremely challenging because, and, and again, I have to say rightfully so. If I made a suggestion, these guys would look at each other and they're going, why in the hell are we listening to this buffoon? And, and I couldn't, I couldn't fault him for it. So, it made it made making that record difficult, not impossible, but difficult. Right. And gradually over time, you know, I kind of, you know, the edge came off just a little bit with certain people. It came off sooner than others. I mean, Robin Crosby uh, warmed up to me the quickest. Well, Rob wasn't Robin. He was pretty much the the guy in rap, wasn't he? Yes, at that point in time, Rob, it was Robin's band. Yeah. Now, of course, Stephen would tell you differently, and everybody sure, in the band would tell you differently. <laughs> but from watching the way that that everybody looked at him and looked up to him, you know, usually if he said, "Yeah, I think that's okay," everybody would kind of back off and they'd go, "Well, okay, yeah, whatever." Yeah. So you know that that record had its challenges, to be sure. On round and round in particular, and I've 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 told this story a hundred times, but the original version, the there was a rest right before the chorus. So it da 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 boom, round and round. Right, right. And and it killed me because I was going, guys, you're 
the chorus is supposed to lift it and you're putting a hole right before the chorus and it kills the energy. So we got to do something with that hole. And these guys would not, they would not budge. It was like, nope, that's the way we're doing it. And nope, we like it that way and blah, 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 blah. And so I did, I lobbied as hard as I possibly could. You know, we need to put a drum fill in there. We need to put an extra guitar lick. We need to do something that's going to point it, that, that transition into the chorus. And they weren't having it. So back in, well, actually all the time, um, I would go to the studio a couple of hours early, early in the morning before the band would ever show up just so I could review what we did the day before, you know, and I could just clear my head, have a cup of coffee without everybody on top of me. And so I was in there screwing around one day and I thought, and I just, this idea just came to me about the reverse echo that maybe I could get, I could get the timing right where it would kind of fill in that hole and wouldn't offend the band completely. Mm. And so that's, that's kind of where that came from. Mm -hmm. And then what did the band think of that? Well, at first it was it, all of my, and, and I don't say this with an exaggeration, but I'll say 90% of my uh, suggestions stroke ideas were always met with no way. Uh -huh. And then, then I would have to, you know, I had to coerce them. I had to <laughs> lobby. I had to, I had to bow and scrape. I had to do, you know, that kind of stuff. But this was, this was just like, uh, uh Oh my God, that just sounds so weird. Yeah. No, man, that's not going to work. And then, you know, I went, well, okay, how about if we just like really pull it way back? So like no one will ever really hear it. It's just kind of a hint of something. And then I just, I left it in. And as we continued to work, you know, it kept playing back and playing back and they, they kind of got used to it. Right. And so it was like, yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess that's okay. Just don't turn it up any louder. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And I was, oh, yeah, absolutely not. No, no, we, we're not going to do that. No, we, we don't really want to hear it. We just kind of want to feel it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, if it's a feel thing, then I guess that'll work. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. That's, that's, and, um, that's fun. That's a fun story. Go ahead. No, I'm just saying that's fun <laughs> when you hear stories like that. Because, uh, you know, now when I listen to that song, I'm going to hear that differently from from you just having that conversation with me. Yes. I mean, I had, it, it, it was complete resistance. Yeah. And, uh, and the, the funny part I was going to tell you about how round and round got selected was I had finished the record and, and I gave it to Doug and Doug was playing it around the house, around his house. And his, nine-year-old son, Walter, who, who I met back in those days. Uh, I forget, Doug was sitting in his home office and something like that, and he heard Walter singing. Row, 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 row. <laughs> <laughs> his nine-year-old son yes, picked Walter. the single that launched Rat's career and my career. Right. Thank you, Walter. Wow. Now, when you're recording, like, that's your first, like, big album, I guess you would say, right? Mm-hmm. So, do you get paid a flat fee for that, or do you get a percentage of points, or how does that work when you're a new producer like Okay. That? Well, since, again, since I didn't know anything about anything, uh -huh. the only guy that I knew that knew anything about that stuff was Bruce Fairburn, who was my producer. So, I called Bruce, and I said, hey... Uh, I'm going to produce a record for Atlantic. I have no idea. What, what do I ask for? How do I do this? And so he gave me some very good advice and he said, okay, ask for a $15,000 advance and three points going to three and a half at platinum. And I was just like, 
whoa, 15,000. <laughs> he said, he said, yeah, yeah. He said, you know, you're, you're an unknown guy, so you can't really get too much more. But he said, yeah, that would be, uh, I don't think anybody would have any objection to that. And so I went, okay. And that's what I asked for. So, and that's what I got. So now when you get points, do you continue to get the, that to, to this day? Absolutely. Nice. That's a hell of a deal then. It's a, it's a hell of a deal. And, but who would have known? Right. You don't know. You don't <laughs> you know. know. So, so even do you get po- like uh, points off of the singles, like round and round being used in the Geico commercial and stuff? Well, that, that's a yes and a no. Okay. So uh, the, the no part of it is that Rat went in and they re-recorded it at Juan's studio. Oh, okay. I get it. So that was not technically right. my recording. I see However, the, uh, the public at large had no idea. Right. And so I definitely noticed a huge spike in, uh, in my royalty that quarter. Yeah because of that but rat didn't want to have to uh pay atlantic and so they just re-recorded it right okay i see i've heard that um other bands doing that kind of thing too yeah i mean you know it's it's a way to keep the money get around it Yeah. yeah yeah okay all right so they must have liked you after that album because you went on to do a few more of their albums. No, they did not. They didn't. No. <clears throat> the the dirty little secret is Rat fired me in a very destructive public way after every single record. <laughs> after every one. After every record. <laughs> My attorney would call me (laughs) and he said, Hey, did you see billboard? (laughs) No, I haven't seen it yet. Um, okay. You know, go to page 13. You got fired today. (laughs) Let me guess. I'm fired from rat. (laughs) Really? (laughs) And he, he said, yep, you're done. You're toast. And then he would get a call from Doug Morris's office and I would get a call from Doug and Doug said, there is absolutely no fucking way that you're not doing that next <laughs> record. And so, so I'm calling Marshall, and I'm telling Marshall I'm dropping the band unless they stop this bullshit. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, and but it's kind of funny. It is funny. <laughs> and so then, then we kind of got into this weird uh, kind of psychodrama, you know, where the band would, would reluctantly give in because Atlantic was going to drop them because of me, which is really, I mean, wow. What a, what an endorsement from Atlantic, you know? Um, (laughs) and then they would go, you know, Marshall would arrange, okay, um, let's go do a sushi dinner and see if we can patch things up and blah, 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 blah. And then I would go out to dinner with, all of the guys individually and they would vent their spleen on what they didn't like and what they did like and what they were upset about and blah, blah, blah. Normally it was my song selection for the records. Uh, Rat is a very, very competitive internal organization. Uh, And I think that an argument could be made that they don't really like each other very much, but they tolerate each other for what they bring financially to the, to the corporation. Right. And they work well as a unit. Yeah. And so when it came to song selections, I mean, my phone was ringing all hours of the night. You know, one guy would call and say, Hey, listen, man, you know, that song that Juan wrote, you know, we really think that's a piece of shit. You know, we don't want to do it. And I was like, Oh, okay. Well, thanks very much for giving me your opinion. And, but anyway, it was up to me. 
So I got all the demos from everybody and I got all the lobbying and I got all the pluses and the minuses. So in rat universe, that meant every single record, somebody was going to be mad at me because I didn't pick their song and you were going to get fired. And I, well, (laughs) and that's why I got fired at the end, you know, was because I didn't pick their song. And if I would have picked their song, Rather than selling three million records, they would have sold four million records, right, and it right. was my fault. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> and this really got to be kind of funny, you know, because you know my attorney would start calling me, and it was like, "Did I get fired yet?" Yep, page four. <laughs> <laughs> and they, and they did it, but they did it in a really kind of a nasty way. It was like they wanted to demean me to the rest of the industry and other bands and things like that. No, you don't want to work with this guy, man. He's an asshole. He's blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah. And then after we sold another 2 million records or 3 million records, then it was like, ah, whatever. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's a crazy story. Yeah. What what would you say is your favorite rat record? Reach for the Sky. Okay, okay. I'd have to say, you know, I'm one of those guys, like when people ask me a favorite ACDC record or a favorite uh, Motley Crue record or whatever, I always pick the one that most people don't like for some reason. So, for example, the one that I like with Rat, I like Dancing Undercover. See, that was my least favorite. See? And actually, yeah. I misspoke. I misspoke. I think that um, Invasion was a real, it was, that that was a fun record. Dancing was really, really, really a, a bad record. And so when I got fired off that, I was happy that it was over. <laughs> but you know all this stuff, right? All what stuff? <clears throat> what happened with uh, Reach for the Sky? No, what happened? Okay. So Rat fired me after dancing. I went, thank God I'm done. We're all happy. Everything's good. So they go in and they, they're working with Mike Stone on um, Reach for the Sky. And they get all the tracks cut, get the vocals, or at least the rough vocals done. They send it to Doug. And, and Doug calls me and he says, you owe me a favor. And I went, absolutely. What would you like for me to do? And he said, you need to come in and fix this rat record. And I was like, why? And his quote to me was, he said, these guys sound like a bad Holiday Inn band. Oh, no. <laughs> and you're like, here that we go. That was the exact quote. Oh, I wish I could have seen their face when you walked in. Well, no. And Doug called Marshall and said, you know, uh, Bo has agreed to come in and fix this. And so everybody knew. So it, it okay. was, it, there was no surprise. I mean, Doug said, I'm not putting this fucking record out. You're right. There's no way. And, you know, it's like, okay, so what do you want us to do? Hire Bo <laughs> and yeah. fix this thing. And so, you know, That's we all had to eat a little bit of, of humble pie. Sure. And uh, shake hands and go, okay, let's, let's kick ass one more time. Yeah. Do you talk to those guys and, today? Go ahead. Do you talk do you talk to those guys at all today? The only guy that I speak to on a semi regular basis is Steven. And and Steven and I had, had a very interesting, crazy relationship because you know, in the studio he did whatever he did and I would say, Hey Steven, why don't you try this? This was on the on uh, out of the cellar, mm-hmm. and he'd try it, and I'd go, okay, I, th- I think that's really great. And so f- when we went to do Invasion, and we were in pre-production of Invasion, and this was another one of the big crises that everybody hated, was Stephen didn't show up for pre-production, and it, and it pissed everybody off. <laughs> it was like you know we're all sitting in Burbank in a hot, sweaty rehearsal room and Steven won't show up. And everybody said, Steven, what the fuck's wrong with you? Why don't you show up? And he said, I don't need to. 
because Bo's just going to sing to me what he wants me to sing, and I'm going <laughs> to sing it. <laughs> and you and you're probably like, well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Yeah, and but it really made everybody mad. Yeah, I mean they went they went crazy about that. That's so funny. And so, yeah, and so Steve and Stephen and I, you know, it just we just kind of figured out a way to work with each other. And I'd I'd say, why don't you try this? And then after a while, it just became okay, Bo. What's the next line? What do you want me to sing? <laughs> right, right. And I and I'd sing it to him, and and he'd go, okay, sounds cool. Let's go. Yeah. And that was it. Now, you worked with a lot of different bands, you know, Warrant, Winger, Twisted Sister. I mean, those projects, those other bands, were were there some things that were similar to your experiences with Rat when you got into those other bands? Or did, was there? No. Huh. No, because, well, it was completely different because I had a track record at that point. See, Rat, I had nothing. Yeah, okay. There was no reason for me to be there at all. And indeed, they were probably justifiably so scared to death that their one shot was going to be barbecued by a guy with no track record at all. And I would not begrudge them that feeling to this day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I see. So then, like, working with Warren, they already knew what you could do. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, I I got the first warrant gig when Rat was had already gone platinum. Yeah. So Yeah. And was was screaming up the charts and so Warrant was that was easy. Yeah. Now I heard Cherry Pie that the song Cherry Pie was that was a last minute selection, wasn't it? Yes. Did you have something to do with that selection or how did that happen? Uh we finished Warrant two, and I went to Janie and I said, "Listen, we don't have a we don't have a lead single, and so I'm I'm reluctant to I don't want to deliver this because we don't have anything that they're going to go with, which was a, a mistake on my part. I mean, there were so many great songs on that record, but it was the lead single." you know, that, that, that raises all boats. Mm -hmm. If you have one good, one good single, then everything else starts sounding better. If you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel that we had a lead single. I, I went, you know, we can throw something out there, but it doesn't seem like, like a, a, a prudent thing to do with a with an with a band that's already gone, you know, multi platinum on their debut record, which very few bands ever do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And twenty four hours later, <laughs> I had Cherry Pie. Yeah, it was quick. I mean, twenty four hours later, he went home and wrote it. Huh. <laughs> and then when you I mean, when you heard it, did you know that was it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that was one that was, that was undeniable. Well, plus, you know, I, I had had, I'd gained some experience. I kind of understood the dynamic between, uh, the record company, MTV, what they wanted and retail. I mean, this was all a learning process for me. Yeah. Um, as this, as this, um, uh, juvenile industry, was really starting to take shape. Mm -hmm. And, and so, since this was record number two with those guys, I saw what people responded to on record number one. And, and that's what led me to my conclusion to Janie. I said, look, we've got great songs, but I don't think we've got one of those blowups that MTV is going to get behind and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So, and that's and that I think that turned out to be a good call. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I would say so. <clears throat> yeah, and um, you know, slight slightly off topic. Uh -huh. um, three days before Janie died, he called me, 
and we had a really n- wonderful chat and he he was completely lucid he he was just it was like I talked to him yesterday and he, he was bemoaning cherry pie. And he said, you know, I'm, I've got some bad feelings about being known as the cherry pie guy and stuff like that. And I said, are you crazy? Right. That's a rock anthem for the ages forever. Yeah. That doesn't come along often. No. And, that that's like we will rock you. I mean, for crying out loud, and um, and for some reason he he felt somewhat diminished by that. And I and I hope that I that I helped him not feel that way. Because right. that 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 kind of hurt my heart. Yeah, that he judged himself so harshly with that and he he missed the big picture you know and i mean how how many silly songs does d snyder have right right but no one's gonna forget him ever no not at all i mean that song like you said that's gonna be around forever I mean, people that aren't even mm-hmm. really into that kind of music will probably know that song. Of course. You know? Yeah. Anyway, I, as I digress, I'm sorry. Yeah, no worries. No worries. So around this time, what is this? Like the early 90s when you were working with, late 80s, early 90s with Warrant and Winger and stuff, right? Yeah. Okay. So when when the style started to shift, I mean, were you getting a lot of work at that time? So give me a little more detail on when styles started to shift. The sound, when the sound started shifting. You know, they, everyone always says, oh, the Seattle scene came in. But, I mean, were you still in high demand once uh, the Sound Gardens, the Alice in Chains, and all those bands started coming in? Okay. So when Nirvana came in and ruined <laughs> the hard rock scene that I was part of, yeah. I was already putting together Interscope. I see. Okay. So no, what, what made so you, I was, go ahead. No, what made you go into Interscope? Why'd you want to do that? Oh, in 19, I want to say 1990. Um, I got a call from Irving and Irving wanted to meet at his Malibu beach home with me and Jimmy Iovine. And so we both went out there and had a meeting with Irving. And I forget, I think his label at that point was called Republic. I probably got that wrong. Anyway, he wanted, he wanted Jimmy and I to come on board with his new label. And I thought, well, okay, that's interesting. And, and that kind of sparked the Interscope thing. There wasn't enough money involved to make that that new startup really viable as far as, as um, Jimmy and I were concerned. Mm-hmm. But it was, it was a catalyst for, you know, a new startup – kind of driven by producers rather than, you know, marketers and accountants and, and things like that. Right. So that, that started, uh, the next step was, was with Doug, obviously, you know, because Jimmy did a ton of records for Atlantic, as did I, and and Doug, you know, and I kept bugging him, and I, I kept saying, "Why don't you make me like a a, a VP of A and R?" And he said, "No, no, 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 no. That's not something that you want to do. You know, there's something else out there for you." And so I was like, "Okay, whatever." And 
And then Doug gave, uh, when he found out Jimmy and I were talking to, uh, uh, to Irving, he said, okay, I'll give you guys a deal for a, a sub label through Atlantic and I'll give you 20 million. And I went, Oh, okay. And Jimmy said, not nearly enough. So we kind of floated around with this idea. And then Jimmy uh, went to a, some fundraiser in Beverly Hills or something like that um, and ran into Ted Fields, who was from the uh, um, Chicago Sun-Times and the Marshall Fields estate. And, you know, they were chatting and Jimmy said, yeah, we just got an offer from Atlantic for 20 mil. And Ted said, um, well, I'm starting my own label and I'm funding it with my own personal money and I'm starting it at 200 million and I'm dedicating the 10th floor of the office building that I own <laughs> on Wilshire <laughs> Boulevard Jesus. Uh, to set up my label. And blah, 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 blah. So one day passes and Jimmy calls me and he says, listen, if you want to do that deal with Doug for $20 million, go ahead. But I'm doing this deal with Ted Field at $200 million and I've got the corner office on the 10th floor on Wilshire. And I was, I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. And... Uh, and so that's that's kind of how that whole Interscope thing started. I mean, it was a it was an Atlantic um, initiation, mm -hmm. and then and then you know I started getting I started feeling weird because of, because of Doug, you know, and I was just like, man, look, you can't, or for me, it, maybe it wasn't the smartest business decision. But it was, it was just how I'm wired. It was like, you know, Doug gave me my start, and I'm going to do everything that I can to repay that in any way that I can. Sure. And so once we, once we started in with Ted, then the whole thing became, okay, who's going to be the – who's going to distribute? And that became a big deal. Uh, is it going to be Time Warner? Is it going to be whoever it is? And so we start having all these meetings with these uh, uh, higher ups and lawyers and things like that. And then, you know, I said, it, "It's got it. We we've got to do it through Wea. We've got to do it with Doug." And so that's why in the early days, Atlantic was involved with um, Interscope. Mm. So what, I mean, this is probably way more in the weeds than your listeners want to hey, be Hey, you know what? That's but. okay. That's okay. I like that. Now, real quick, tell me, what's the difference between like a development deal, a publishing deal, and a record deal? Well, um, back in the day, you know, a development deal was, um, okay, Joe, we like your band. You know, we think there might be something there. We're going to give you $5,000 jump in your local studio and and cut three songs of your best songs and then we're going to run it up the flagpole and see if the staff at Electra likes it. Mm, okay. Makes sense. That's a development deal. And then and then they would they would keep the rights to those songs. So so that you they they pay for for the recording. And so it's their property. You can't turn around and take Electra product and send it to Warner Brothers. I see. Okay. So that's a development deal. A record deal is we love your band. We love your songs. Um, we think you're going to be great. And we're willing to offer you XYZ uh, up front. And we're willing to offer you a royalty of XYZ. And do you want to sign with us and be our... Um, product. That's it. And then the publishing, where, where does that come in? Publishing deal. Okay. Well, 
in the old days, um, the publishing went, did not go to the artist, but as the 70s and 80s came in, okay, okay, a million years ago, <laughs> there were song pluggers, and so the song pluggers got the publishing, so 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 Joe writes a song called uh, Hey Mama, <laughs> and Hey Mama goes to the song plugger that sends it to Elvis's management, and Elvis's management says, yeah, we like this, and, um, and so they do it. And the price of doing business was the publishing rights. As more bands started uh, writing their own material, they were just like, wait a minute, why in the hell are we doing these public, these weird publishing deals? You know, we wrote it, nobody right. else wrote it, so, and nobody else plugged it. We're the only person recording the song, we're the only person doing it. So why in the hell do we need to pay somebody else to do it? So that's, that's kind of how that, the genesis of how that started was that the rock bands that people were, were signing and recording in the seventies and eighties <clears throat> wrote all their own material. Mm -hmm. And so they went, why do we, we don't need song pluggers. You know, we've plugged our own song into our own record, into our own deal. So we don't need that. Yeah. And we want to maintain the publishing rights. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that understanding. So do you think, do you think the record labels as we used to know them, do you think they will ever rebound or do you think things are starting to, like bands don't need a record label as much anymore, correct? As far as I can tell, no. Right. They don't. It, it's, it's a... You know, it, I was so blessed to be in time where I was to watch this thing explode. Yeah. And, and I don't see either a, um, a financial or... I, I don't really see any way that the record companies can come back into power like like they were, mm -hmm. uh, either economic or aesthetic or whatever. Uh, as you write, as you rightly say, the you know I think that ship has sailed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now these days you're still. Yeah, I, Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to no, say, I'm... these days you're still producing and mixing bands, correct? I'm I'm not doing any production as far as like me going in the studio and sitting around with somebody and saying, no, no, your, uh, your E string is a little flat. Right. <laughs> I right. don't do that. <laughs> but, but again, because of the internet, I get files from bands around the world that I've never spoken to never met and they just know me by reputation and they send me they say will you mix our stuff and master it and i listen to it and i go sure mm -hmm. and give them the information so the fire transfer goes here the files go here and i'll get you a first draft of your song on tuesday Hmm. Okay. Now, do you get files? So it, I, I'm, I'm just learning the mixing process. I've been doing some recording and, and I'm trying to learn the mixing process on my own. But when you're going into a mix, you need solid, uh, I guess, starting files, right? Your, your, your core files have to be good quality to get a good mix. Well, that's yes and no. Um, obviously, if the if the recording, the original recording is done well, 
then, you know, it's, you know, dirty in, dirty out. So it, it makes things a lot better. Mm -hmm. But because I have been working in this particular medium for so long that, that the workaround for bad recordings is, I won't say I'll say is a, is much more forgiving than it was previously. Okay. Uh, you know, with things like auto tune, and you know, there's a lot of technology that you can tap into. Now, if if something is just crap, then I won't I won't touch it. I mean, it, it's if I can't make it better, I'm not gonna besmirch you know, my reputation and my name. Sure. You know, I'm just not going to do it. Yeah. And plus it's no fun for me. So na nowadays in this part of my life, I do this because I really love it yeah. and I'm passionate about it and I have fun. I mean, I have a smile on my face <laughs> no matter how weird it is. And believe me, I get everything weird that you could possibly imagine. Yeah. But I do it because I love it, and it's fun. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, you know, as long as you can keep smiling and you're having fun, why not keep doing it? Oh, yeah. So I play a little golf in the morning on the driving range. I come in, mix a little in the afternoon, and then I go to the gym, and, man, yeah. life's good. <laughs> Life is good for Bo. Man. Yeah. I sit here in front of a, my computer trying to mix stuff. I have no idea what I'm doing. Okay. Well, <laughs> when we get off this call, whenever you want to call me and we can discuss your mixing issues and I can give you some, I can give you some unasked for <laughs> uh, thoughts to process. That would be fantastic. But I would be more than glad to do so. What I'll do is uh, and, I'll send you one of my mixes and you can say, this sounds like shit or not a bad start. Well, oh, and the other, believe one of the artists that I worked with a lot, and he has a weird band name called um, The Many. Oh, fuck. It's The Many Something Death. They're out of um, Missouri. Fantastic band. And. And he and I did a little um, mixing symposium just between us. He was saying, Bo, how do you do this? Why do you do that? What do you do here? And how do you do that? And blah, 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 blah. And, you know, the, the fun thing about mixing is that everybody's right and everybody's wrong all at the same time. And so it's it's so personal and so subjective that there really isn't a right or a wrong way to do it. It's just, you know, how can I arrive at the result that I want to arrive at? And and that's what he and I, the many colored death. That was it. Mm. The many colored death. You got to check them out. Because those guys are spectacular. And to digress slightly, the reason why they're spectacular is that most bands send me 10 songs of a rewrite of the first song, so they're all kind of similar. Mm -hmm. These guys, these guys are the absolute opposite of that. Hmm. And, and, and they're called what? Say it again. Many, what are they called? The Many Colored... Yeah. Colored. All right. This this cable is giving me problems again. The many colored death, and yeah. these guys are spectacular um, musicians <clears throat> in their own right. And the the thing that I loved about them is that they don't keep sending me the same song. Yeah. It's really, really different. So that tells me there's some super brain power behind this. Yeah. But anyway, Brent, who is the the 
the primary in in that band <clears throat> asked me to you know let's talk about how to how to mix and it was really fun so i throw that out to you if you're really interested in that i can give you some ideas and i can give you some some um uh some texture behind it mm-hmm. and it may work for you or it may not work for you but at least it'll be yeah no definitely a, a I will, starting point i would definitely take you up on that because i love mixing even though i don't know what i'm doing and i could imagine if i know what i'm doing it'd be even more fun well what i can tell what i'll tell you is not what you know mixing but what hopefully i'll give you is an idea yeah and so you won't you won't be able to do what i do or wouldn't want to do what i do but i may trigger an idea for you and you go oh fuck man okay i kind of understand that on the fringes but i want to drive it more to the left or more to the right or whatever yeah yeah okay you got it and are you on pro tools no i'm using cubase actually Okay. Well, it's 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 still digital. So yeah. I can I can give you I can give you some ideas that you can play with. Uh, that's it. Yeah. No, that'd be great. I, I really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Whenever right. whenever you you have a minute, uh, give me a call and say, okay, Bo, I want to do a little mix session, and I'll I'll do it. No problem. That's awesome. I I appreciate that. All right, Bo. I, I know I've I've kept I've got so many more questions. I could keep talking to you all night, but uh, I know I've kept you on here a while now. Um, so maybe maybe we can do this again sometime. Of course, when, whenever you like. Sure. Listen, if you have anything else, I mean, uh, my my wife is back in bed. So <laughs> if you have anything else you want to ask me, ask me. Yeah. No. No. I mean, like I said, I could keep going. You know what you should do is write a book. <laughs> you ever think you know, about you're that? The, you're the ninetieth person that's told me that. Oh, man, you should. It'd be amazing. I appreciate it, Joe. And listen, <laughs> honestly, whenever whenever you get a, a spare minute, just pick up the phone and say, "Bo, I need a little mix chat," and we'll chat. Sure, I will. And I'll learn stuff from you too. You know, because you're going to tell me stuff that you you're going to say, "Oh, I do this and this and this and this and this," and I'm going to go, "Oh." Fuck, man, I had never thought about that. Right, right. That's awesome. And that's what makes it fun. Yeah. All right, Bo. Well, again, I appreciate it. All right, buddy. Um, it was great talking to you. My and, pleasure. Uh, hey, did you get the email I sent you earlier? I just want to make sure I had the email correct. I did. Okay, good, good. All right, man. All right. Well, I'll be in touch, okay? Thanks, Joe. Good all luck, right. man. Thank you. We'll see you. That's all for this week. Join us next week for another episode of the Rock and Roll and Coffee Show podcast. Available on all your favorite podcast listening platforms.